Ecbert the Fair. Deep in the Hartz Mountains there lived a knight who was commonly known simply as Ecbert the Fair. He was some forty years old, little more than medium height, with short, light blonde hair that hung in a plain fashion, closely framing his pale, drawn face. He led a peaceful, solitary life, never becoming involved in his neighbour's quarrels, and was seldom seen beyond the boundary walls of his small castle. His wife was equally fond of such solitude, and they seemed to love each other dearly, yet they often bemoaned the fact that heaven had not seen fit to bless their marriage with children. Only rarely did Eckbert receive guests, and when any did come, then almost nothing of the daily rhythm of life was changed for their benefit. Moderation had made its home among them, and thrift itself seemed the rule of law. On such occasions, Eckbert was merry and light-hearted, and it was only when he was alone that he displayed a certain air of reticence, one of silent, reserved melancholy. No one visited the castle as often as Philip Valter, a largely like-minded man to whom Eckbert had attached himself, and of whom he was most fond. Valter actually lived in Franconia, but often spent more than half the year in the vicinity of Eckbert's castle, gathering plants and stones, and busying himself with their classification. He was in possession of a modest fortune, and depended on no one. Eckbert often accompanied him on his lonely walks, and over the years a deep friendship had grown between them. There are times when it troubles a man to keep a secret from a friend, a secret which, until then, had been guarded with the utmost care. His soul is overcome by an irresistible desire to confide completely, to bear its innermost emotions to that friend, so that their friendship can become even closer. It might be the case, in such moments, that those more tender souls will come to appreciate one another more, yet, sometimes, it might also drive one party to shy away from acquaintance with the other. It was already autumn when, on a misty evening, Eckbert sat with his friend and his wife at the fireside. The flames filled the chamber with a light glow and playfully lit the ceiling above. The black night peered in at the windows and the trees outside shivered in the damp cold. Valter complained of the long homeward journey that lay before him, and Eckbert suggested that he stay, to spend half the night in companionable conversation, and then to sleep until morning in a chamber in the castle. Walter fell in with this suggestion, and wine and supper were served. The fire was stoked with wood, and the friend's conversation grew merrier and more intimate. Once the evening meal had been cleared away, and the servants had once more withdrawn, Eckbert took Walter's hand and said, Dear friend, you must allow my wife to recount to you the tale of her youth. It is most odd. A pleasure, said Walter, and they all took their places once more round the hearth. It had just turned midnight, and every now and then the moon peered through the clouds that drifted overhead. You must not think me too forward, began Berta. My husband says that you are so noble of mind that it is wrong to hide anything from you. Yet do not take my story for a fairy tale, however strange it may sound. I was born in a village. My father was a poor shepherd. My parents were very poor and often unsure where the next loaf of bread was coming from. What pained me far more was that my father and mother often quarrelled over their, their poverty and blamed one another bitterly. What was more, I constantly heard myself being called a simple, stupid child, incapable of carrying out even the most menial of tasks, and I was indeed utterly awkward and clumsy. I let everything fall from my fingers. I mastered neither sewing nor spinning. I could do nothing of use on the farm, 
and, indeed, my parents' poverty was all I had a real understanding for. I often sat in the corner and filled my head with ways to help them if I should suddenly become rich. How I would shower them with gold and silver and revel in their amazement. I conjured up spirits in my mind who would show me hidden treasure or give me tiny pebbles that were transformed into precious stones. In short, the most wonderful fantasies preoccupied me, and then, afterwards, when I had to get up and lend a hand or carry something, I seemed even more awkward, for my head still span with all these strange illusions. My father was always angry with me for being such a useless burden on the household. He often treated me rather cruelly, and it was rare for me to hear a friendly word from him. Such had been my life when, at roughly the age of eight, serious efforts began to be made for me to do or learn something. My father believed it to be mere obstinacy or laziness on my part to spend my days in idleness and so he treated me even more harshly, and set about me with quite unrepeatable threats. When these bore no fruit, he beat me in the most cruel way, saying that the punishment would be repeated every day, for I was little more than a useless creature. I wept bitterly the whole night through. I felt so completely abandoned and so sorry for myself that I wanted to die. I feared the break of day and simply did not know what course of action to take. I prayed for every skill imaginable and just could not understand why I was more simple than all the other children I knew. I was close to despair. As day dawned I rose and, almost without knowing it, opened the door of our little hut. I found myself in the open field and soon after in a wood where the light of day could hardly be seen. I kept running onwards without looking about me. I felt no fatigue, for I believed my father would catch up with me and, angered by my flight, treat me even more cruelly. When I emerged from the woods once more, the sun was quite high in the sky. I could see something dark in front of me, covered by a thick fog. First I had to climb over hillocks, then follow a twisting path between cliffs and it was then I guessed that I must be in the nearby mountains, the thought of which, in such solitude, made me feel quite afraid. While living on the plains I had never seen the mountains, and when I heard people talk of them, the mere mention of the word was quite terrifying to my child's ear. But I did not have the heart to turn back. My fear drove me on. I often looked round in fright when the wind rustled through the trees above or the distant sound of an axe chopping wood resounded through the morning silence. When, finally, I came across some charcoal burners and miners and heard their unfamiliar accent, I all but fainted in dismay. I passed through several villages, begging, for I was hungry and thirsty. I muddled through with excuses whenever I was questioned. I had travelled on like this for some four days when I came upon a small footpath which took me ever further from the main highway. The cliffs around me then took on another, much stranger appearance. There were crags so closely packed together that it looked as if the first gust of wind that came along would make them topple over. I did not know whether I should continue. At night I slept in the woods, for it was the mildest season of the year, or in a remote shepherd's hut, but there was no human dwelling to be seen, and I could not hope to find one in this wilderness. The cliffs became ever more fearsome, and I often had to pass close to dizzying chasms. Eventually, even the path beneath my feet came to an end. Feeling quite disconsolate, I wept and cried out, my voice echoing back from the cliffs in a dreadful way. Night began to draw in, and I looked for a mossy patch upon which to rest. I could not sleep, for in the night I heard the most uncanny sounds. At first I thought they came from wild animals, then from the wind moaning through the cliffs, then from strange birds. 
I prayed and only much later, towards morning, did I fall asleep. I awoke as the day dawned. In front of me was a steep cliff, which I climbed in the hope of being able to spy from there and escape from the wilderness, and perhaps even dwellings or people. Yet, as I stood at the top, everything as far as my eye could see, as well as everything around me, was covered in a misty haze. The day was grey and dull. I could not spy one tree, one meadow, not one bush other than the lone miserable shrubs that had sprouted from the narrow cracks in the cliffs. It is impossible to describe the yearning I felt at that moment for the sight of another person, even if it were someone of whom I would have been afraid. At the same time, I felt a torturous hunger. I sat down and made up my mind to die. After some time, however, the will to live won me over. I pulled myself to my feet and, in tears, carried on walking, sobbing intermittently the whole day long. By the end, I barely knew who I was. Tired and exhausted, I hardly wanted to live on, yet still I was afraid to die. Towards evening, the surrounding countryside seemed to become somewhat friendlier, and my thoughts and wishes were once more revived as the desire to live was reawakened in all my veins. I was convinced that I could hear the turning of a mill wheel in the distance. I doubled my pace, and how relieved I was when I really did reach the end of the wild cliffs. I once more saw woods and meadows and distant mountains before me. It was as if I had come out of hell and walked into paradise. The isolation and my helplessness now no longer seemed at all frightening. Instead of the much hoped for mill, however, I came upon a waterfall, which of course greatly lessened my joy. As I scooped up a mouthful from the stream with my hand, I suddenly thought I could hear a soft coughing sound some distance away. Never have I been so pleasantly surprised as I was at that moment. I went closer, and, at the edge of the wood, I could make out the form of an old woman, who seemed to be resting. She was dressed almost entirely in black, and a black hood covered her head and a large part of her face. In her hand she held a walking stick. I approached her and asked for her help. She let me sit down at her side and gave me some bread and wine. While I ate, she sang a hymn in a screeching voice. When she had finished, she asked me to follow her. I was most happy to follow this request, even though her voice and her manner seemed rather odd to me. She moved fairly nimbly with her walking stick and pulled such a face with every step that, at first, I had to laugh. The wild cliffs lay ever further behind us as we crossed a pleasant meadow and made our way through a rather dense wood. When we emerged, the sun was just setting, and I will never forget the sight and sensation I experienced that evening. Everything was blended into the softest red and gold. The trees stood with their tops brushing against the sunset, and the fields were bathed in an enchanting glow. The woods and the leaves of the trees were still, and the clear sky resembled a beckoning paradise. The bubbling of the springs and, from time to time, the whispering of the trees resounded through the clear calm as if singing of their melancholy joy. For the first time my young soul began to comprehend something of the world and all its wonders. I quite forgot myself, and my guide as both spirit and eyes were lost in rapture among the golden clouds. We then climbed a small hill, which was planted with birch trees. From the top, the view looked over a green valley full of birches, and below, among the trees, there was a little hut. We were met with the sound of excited barking, and soon a small lively dog appeared, jumping up at the old woman, wagging its tail. He then came to me, examined me from all sides, and returned happily to the old woman. As we walked down the hill, I heard wonderful singing that sounded like a bird, and which seemed to come from the hut. 
it sang. Lone woodland still, my constant thrill, your charm today and always will, my constant thrill, lone woodland still. These few words were repeated over and over again. If I were to describe it, I would say it was almost like the distant mingling of a French horn and a shawm. I was extremely curious, and, without waiting for a sign from the old woman, I entered the hut. It was already twilight, and everything was cleared away tidily. There were cups arranged on a wall cupboard, and some strange receptacles stood on a table. A glittering cage with a bird in it hung by the window, and, indeed, it was the bird who sang the words. The old lady wheezed and coughed, seeming unable to recover at all. She went to and fro, stroking the little dog and talking to the bird, whose only response was his customary song. For the most part she behaved as if I were not there at all. As I observed her, I could barely repress a shudder, for her features were constantly in motion as she nodded her head, as if from old age, so that I simply could not tell what she really looked like. Once she had recovered, she lit the lamp, laid a very small table and served the evening meal. At this point she looked round for me and told me to sit in one of the wicker chairs. I sat opposite her with the lamp between us. She folded her bony hands and prayed out loud, her face twitching all the time, so much so that I almost had to laugh again, but I restrained myself for I did not wish to anger her. After supper she prayed once more, and then she showed me to a bed in a low, narrow chamber. She slept in the main room, half numbed with fatigue. I did not remain awake for long, but I did wake a few times in the night, and heard the old woman coughing and speaking to the dog, and occasionally to the bird who seemed to be dreaming, only ever singing a few words from his song. This, combined with the rustling of the birches at the window, and the song of a distant nightingale made such an odd mixture that it never felt as if I were awake, but seemed instead as if I were sinking into another, even stranger dream. In the morning the old woman woke me, and soon afterwards set me to work. I was to spin, and this time I soon mastered it. I was also to care for the dog and the bird. I soon found my way around the household, and the objects around me became familiar. By now it seemed to me that this was all that, as it should be, and I no longer felt that there was something odd about the old lady, nor that the house was unusual and rather isolated, nor that there was something extraordinary about the bird. I was, of course, always conscious of his beauty, for his feathers shimmered with every possible colour. The loveliest pale blue and the fieriest red alternated on his neck and body, and when he sang he puffed out with pride so that his feathers were more impressive than ever. Often the old woman would go out and not return until evening. When she did, I would go and go to meet her with the dog, and she would call me child and daughter. With the passing of time I grew fond of her growing accustomed to her in the way the mind accustoms itself to everything, especially in childhood. In the evenings she taught me to read. I mastered the art with ease, and later it became a source of endless pleasure to me in my solitude, for she had in her possession a few old handwritten books full of marvellous stories. The memories of my life back then still seem strange to me now, never visited by another living soul, being part of such a small family circle. Indeed, I felt for the dog and the bird as I might otherwise feel towards long-standing friends. I have never been able to remember the strange name the dog had, despite having called him by it so often. I had been living with the old woman like this for four years, and must have been almost twelve years old, when she finally trusted me enough to reveal a secret to me. Every day the bird laid an egg, which contained a pearl or a jewel. I had certainly noticed that she dealt with the cage in secret, but had never really concerned myself with it any further. 
She now gave me the task of removing the eggs in her absence and of keeping them safe in the odd receptacles. She left me food and stayed away for longer periods, weeks or even months. My spinning wheel hummed, the dog barked, the wonderful bird sang, and, meantime, everything was so calm around us that I cannot recall there having been a single high wind or storm the whole time I was there. No one ever strayed our way, no animals came near our dwelling. I was content and worked on from one day to the next. Perhaps people would be truly happy if they could live out their lives like this, undisturbed until the end. From the little that I read, I created a wondrous image in my mind of the world and its people. Everything was inspired by my own situation. When it came to happy people, I could not imagine anything other than a little dog. Splendid ladies always resembled the bird, and the old women always looked like my wondrous old woman. I had also read little on the subject of love and span wonderful tales for myself in my imagination. I imagined the handsomest knight in the world. I endowed him with every desirable trait imaginable, without actually knowing how he might look after all my efforts. Indeed, I often felt truly sorry for myself when he did not return my love and would deliver wrought speeches in my thoughts, sometimes even out loud, in order just to win him over. You may laugh. We are all now, of course, beyond that stage of youth. I now much preferred to be alone, for then I was the mistress of the house. The dog loved me very much and did everything I wanted. The bird responded to all my questions with his song. My spinning wheel turned merrily, and I truly felt no desire for change. Whenever the old woman returned from her long journeys, she would praise my care and attention. She said that since my joining it, her household had, was far more orderly. She took pleasure in seeing me grow and in my healthy appearance, and, in short, treated me just like a daughter. You are a good girl, my child, she once said to me in her rough voice. If you continue this way, you will always do well. Yet no one ever prospers if they stray from the true path. Punishment will follow, no matter how late. I was not really paying much heed when she was saying this, for I was a very lively child in all aspects of my character. But it came back to me later that night, and I could not understand what she meant by it. I considered all the words carefully. I had, of course, read of riches, and eventually it occurred to me that her pearls and jewels could probably be of some value. This became increasingly clear to me. But whatever did she mean by the true path? I still could not quite grasp the meaning of her words. By then I was fourteen years old, and it is unfortunate for humanity that wisdom is gained only at the expense of an innocent soul, for it had become clear to me that all I had to do was take the bird and the treasures while the old woman was away and make off with them in search of the world of which I had read. After all, it might even be possible for me to meet that handsome knight who was still ever present in my mind. To begin with, this notion seemed of no more importance than any other, but whenever I sat there at my wheel it would come back to me against my will, and I would lose myself in thought to the extent that I could already see myself beautifully bedecked in jewels with knights and princes all around me. Whenever I forgot myself like this, it distressed me terribly to look up and find myself in the little house. What was more, when I went about my daily tasks, the old woman did not concern herself with what I was doing. One day my hostess set off again, and informed me that this time she would stay away longer than usual. I was to look after everything properly and not waste my time. I bid her farewell with a certain degree of apprehension, for it felt as if I would never see her again. I stood watching her go for a long time, and was myself unsure as to why I felt so afraid. It was almost as if my intentions already lay mapped out without really being clear to me. 
Never had I cared for the dog and the bird with such zeal. They were dearer to me than ever before. The old woman had already been gone for several days when I awoke with the firm intention of taking the bird and leaving the hut to seek out the so-called world. My thoughts were oppressive and troubled me greatly. I wanted to stay on there, but yet the very thought repulsed me. There was a strange battle in my soul, like a struggle between two opposing spirits within me. One minute the peaceful isolation seemed quite beautiful to me. The next I was enticed by the prospect of a new world with all its wonderful variety. I did not know what to make of myself. The dog sprang up at me incessantly. The sunshine spread out happily over the fields and the green birch trees shimmered. Sensing I had something very pressing to do, I seized the little dog and tied him up in the room. Then I took down the cage with the bird in it and put it under my arm. The dog cowered and whined, unaccustomed to such treatment. He looked at me with pleading eyes, but I was afraid to take him with me. I then took one of the vessels filled with jewels and placed it in my apron. The rest I left where they were. The bird moved his head around in a strange fashion as I carried him through the door. The dog strained in anguish, trying to follow me, but he had to stay behind. I avoided the path that led to the wild cliffs and went the opposite way. The dog was still barking and whimpering, and my heart truly bled for him. The bird tried once or twice to strike up his song, but, as I was carrying him, he seemed reluctant to do so. As I walked on, the sound of barking became weaker, and finally it stopped altogether. I wept and almost turned back, but the deep desire to experience something new drove me onwards. I had already crossed the mountains and passed through several forests when evening fell, and I had to make for a village inn. I felt rather unsure of myself as I entered the tavern. I was shown to a room with a bed, where I slept quite peacefully, except when I found myself dreaming of the old woman threatening me. My journey was rather tedious, but the further I went, the more the thought of the old woman and the little dog frightened me. I realised that without my help, he would probably starve to death. In the forest I imagine, often imagined I saw the old woman suddenly coming towards me. Plagued by these thoughts, sighing tearfully, I continued on my way. Every time I rested and placed the cage on the ground, the bird would sing his wondrous song, and each time I could clearly picture the beautiful remote place we had once lived in. Human ne nature being wont to forget, I now imagined my pre previous journey in childhood to have been far less miserable than the one I now endured. I wished I were in the same position again. I had sold a few jewels, and having journeyed for many days, I came to a village. The moment I entered it, I had an odd feeling, but did not know why. I soon realised why, however, for it was the self-same village in which I had been born. How surprised I was! How the tears of joy ran down my cheeks at the recollection of a thousand strange memories. Much had changed. There were new houses. Others which had just been built when I lived there had fallen into disrepair, and I came upon burnt-out ruins too. Everything was much smaller and more cramped than I had expected. I felt boundless pleasure at the prospect of seeing my parents once more after so many years. I found the little house with its old familiar threshold. The door handle was exactly the same as before, and it felt like only yesterday that I had closed it behind me. My heart pounded impetuously as I hastily opened the door, but the faces of those sitting around the room, staring at me, were those of strangers. I asked after the old shepherd Martin, and they told me that he had died some three years ago, along with his wife. I withdrew hastily and left the village weeping aloud. I had long imagined how wonderful it would be to surprise them with my riches, and now, quite by chance, my childhood dream had come true, and yet it was all in vain. They could no longer share my happiness with me, and the one thing I had hoped for most in life was lost to me for ever. 
I took a small house with a garden in a pleasant town and hired a serving maid. The world had not impressed me as much as I had expected, but I gradually forgot about the old woman and my previous home, and, on the whole, I lived quite contentedly. The bird had not sung for a long time. I was, therefore, more than a little startled when he began to sing again one evening. This time the song was different. He sang, Lone woodland still, how far your hills, Repentance stirs, in time it fills. How far your hills, lone woodland still. I was unable to sleep all night. Everything came back to me, and, more than ever, I felt if I had done something wrong. As I rose, the sight of the bird repulsed me. He kept looking over at me, and his presence frightened me. He would not stop singing his song, and sang louder and more resoundingly than ever before. The more I watched him, the more nervous he made me. Finally, I opened the cage, put my hand in, and took hold of his neck. I pressed my fingers together firmly. He looked at me, his eyes pleading, and I let go, but he was already dead. I buried him in the garden. From then on, I often felt afraid of my servant. I thought of my own actions, and of how she in turn could rob or even murder me. For some time I had known a young knight whom I liked very much. I gave him my hand, and with that, Walter, my story is at an end. You ought to have seen her, then, added Egbert hastily, her youth, her beauty, and what mysterious charm her solitary upbringing had blessed her with. She seemed like a miracle to me, and I loved her beyond all measure. I had no fortune. This wealth came with her love. We moved here and have not, to this day, ever had cause to regret our union, not even for one moment. But what chatterboxes we are, said Berta. It is the middle of the night. We ought to retire to bed. She rose to her feet and made to leave for her bedchamber. Valter bid her good night, placed a kiss on her hand as he did so, and said, Noble lady, I thank you. I can clearly picture you with that marvellous bird feeding little Stromian. Valter too retired to bed. Only Eckbert remained, pacing the hall uneasily. Is man not foolish? he said to himself at last. It was at my own bidding that my wife told Walter her tale to begin with, but now I regret this confidence. Will he not abuse it? Will he not tell others? Will he not perhaps, for it is in man's nature, covet our precious jewels with soulless greed, and make then make secret plans to steal them? It occurred to him that Walter had not taken leave of him with quite the warmth one would have expected after hearing such a confidence. Once the soul has begun to harbour suspicion, the notion soon spreads, finding confirmation in the smallest of details. Eckbert reproached himself for this base mistrust of his loyal friend, but yet could not quite put it out of his mind. He tossed and turned, plagued by these thoughts all through the night, and slept very little. Berta was unwell and unable to come down for breakfast. Walter seemed most unconcerned at this, and parted from the night with equal indifference. Eckbert could not fathom his behaviour. He visited his wife. She lay in a fever, and said that the recounting of her tale the night before must have strained her. From that evening, Walter did not visit his friend's castle very often, and when he did come, he left again, after making only a few trivial remarks. Eckbert was tormented in the extreme by this behaviour. He hid it, of course, from Berta and Walter, but his inner agitation must have been obvious to anyone. Berta's illness caused ever more concern, and the physician feared for her life. The colour had drained from her cheeks, and her fevered eyes were burning. One morning she sent for her husband to come to her bedside, and the maids were sent away. "'Dear husband,' she began. I must tell you something which, as unimportant a detail as it might seem, has all but driven me insane and greatly affected my health. 
You know that whenever I spoke of my childhood, I could never, despite every effort, remember the name of the little dog whose company I enjoyed for so long. That evening, as he bade me good night, Walter suddenly said to me, I can clearly picture you feeding little Stromian. Is it a coincidence? Did he guess the name? Did he know it and mention it with some intent? And how is this man linked to my fate? I keep struggling with myself, trying to convince myself that I am imagining this oddity, but it is real, simply too real. I was overcome with unspeakable terror to hear a stranger aid my memory in this way. What do you think, Eckbert? Eckbert looked at his suffering wife, deeply moved. He was silent and thought for a moment. Then he said a few comforting words and left her. In a remote chamber of the castle, he paced up and down in indescribable agitation. Walter had been his only companion for many years, and yet this person was now the only one in the world whose existence threatened and tormented him. It seemed he would be at ease once more, only if this individual could be cleared from his path. Seeking some form of distraction, he took down his crossbow and set out to hunt. It was a raw, stormy winter's day. Deep snow covered the mountains and bent the branches on the trees down to the ground. Eckbert wandered around, beads of sweat on his brow. He shot no game, and this worsened his mood. Suddenly he saw something moving in the distance. It was Walter gathering moss from the trees. Without realising what he was doing, Eckbert took aim. Walter looked round and threatened with a silent gesture, but at that moment the bolt flew from the bow and Walter fell to the ground. Eckbert felt relieved and reassured, yet a cold fear drove him back towards his castle. He had a long way to go, for he had strayed deep into the forest. By the time he arrived, Berta had already passed away. Before her death, she had spoken a great deal about Walter and the old woman. Thereafter, Eckbert lived for a long time in the greatest solitude. He had long been melancholy in nature, for his wife's strange story troubled him deeply, and he had always feared some unhappy event. But now he was quite at odds with himself. The murder of his friend was forever on his mind, and he lived with continual self-reproach. In an attempt to amuse himself, he occasionally ventured to the nearest large town, where he attended gatherings and celebrations. He hoped to fill the emptiness through some new acquaintance or another. Yet, whenever he thought of Valta anew, he was filled with fear at the prospect of finding a new friend, for he was convinced that he could only be unhappy, no matter who that friend might be. He had lived for such a long time in peaceful harmony with Berta, the friendship with Walter had brought him so much happiness over the years, and now both had been carried off so suddenly that at times his life seemed more akin to a strange fairy tale than reality. A young knight by the name of Hugo befriended the silent, troubled Eckbert and seemed to be truly fond of him. Eckbert was most pleasantly surprised and returned the knight's friendship all the more readily, having expected it so little. The pair were now often together, and the stranger showed Eckbert every possible favour. The one now hardly ever rode without the other. They met at every gathering and seemed inseparable. Yet Eckbert was only ever happy for brief moments at a time, for he was sure that Hugo must be mistaken in his love for him. He did not know him, he did not know his story, and Eckbert was plagued by the same compulsion to tell Hugo everything so that he could be sure of his friendship. But then he was once more held back by anxiety and the fear of rejection. There were moments when he was so utterly convinced of his worthlessness that he believed no person to whom he was not a complete stranger could grant him their respect. Still, he could not contain himself. While out on a lonely ride, Eckbert recounted his whole story to his friend and then asked him if he could truly love a murderer. Hugo was moved and tried to comfort, Eck, comfort him. 
Eckbert followed him back to town with a lighter heart. Yet Eckbert seemed doomed to harbour suspicion from the very moment his trust had been placed. For hardly had he entered the hall than he sensed displeasure in the faces of his friends under the glare of the many lights. He was sure that Hugo's smile was mocking him. He began to notice that Hugo seemed to be avoiding him while paying far more heed to the other guests. Among the assembled company there was an old knight who had always made a point of opposing Eckbert and who had often inquired after his riches and his wife in a rather peculiar manner. Hugo sought him out and the pair spoke secretly together for some time, pointing to Eckbert as they did so. The latter now had his suspicions confirmed. He thought he had been betrayed and a terrible anger possessed him. As he continued to stare across at them, he suddenly saw Walter's face, all his features, his entire, all too familiar figure. Eckbert continued to stare and was convinced that it was none other than Walter himself talking to the old man. His horror was indescribable. Beside himself, he rushed outside. He left the town that very night and returned, after losing his way many times, to his castle. Once there, Eckbert rushed from room to room like a restless spirit, unable to compose himself at all. His mind lurched from one dreadful thought to another, horror mounting on horror. He could not sleep a wink. He often felt that he must be insane, and that everything was simply a wild figment of his imagination. Then he would remember Walter's features again, and everything became even more of a mystery to him. He decided to go on a journey in an attempt to bring his thoughts into order. The notion of friendship, the desire for human contact, were abandoned forever. Eckbert set off with no particular route in mind. Indeed, he paid scant attention to the landscape before him. Having ridden on in haste for a few days at full pelt, he suddenly found he had strayed into a labyrinth of cliffs from which there appeared to be no means of escape. Eventually, he met a peasant who showed him a path across a waterfall. Eckbert wanted to give him a few coins to show his gratitude, but the peasant refused. What does it matter? Eckbert said to himself. I could almost begin to imagine him to be none other than Valta. And with that, he looked round and saw that it was indeed none other than Valta. Eckbert spurred on his steed as fast as he could run, through meadows and woods, until it collapsed exhausted beneath him. Unperturbed by this, he continued his journey on foot, as if in a dream he climbed a hill. He thought he could make out the sound of excited barking nearby. Birches rustled in the background, and he heard the words of a song being sung in wonderful tones. Lone woodland still, again my thrill, no envy stirs, no hate can kill. Again my thrill, lone woodland still. Eckbert's reason, his senses were now spent. He could find no answer to the mystery. Was he dreaming now, or had he been dreaming before, of a woman called Berta? Wondrous things were mixed with the most ordinary. The world around him seemed to be bewitched, and he was powerless to think or remember. A crooked old woman, leaning on a stick and coughing, approached the mound stealthily. "'Have you brought my bird? My pearls? My dog?' she screamed at him. "'You see, wrong brings its own punishment. Your friend Walter, your Hugo, they were none other than me.' "'God in heaven!' Eckbert whispered to himself. "'What awful solitude have I been living in?' "'And Berta was your sister,' said the old woman." Eckbert sank to the ground. Why did she leave me so treacherously? Everything would have turned out well otherwise. The period of her trial was already over. She was the daughter of a knight who had her brought up by a shepherd, your father's child. Why did I always fear something as terrible as this? cried Eckbert. Because, said the old woman, as a young child, you once heard your father speak of it. He was not allowed to bring this daughter up at home because of his wife, for the child was born of another woman. 
Ekbert lay crazed and dying on the ground. His mind dulled and confused. He heard the old woman speaking, the dog barking, and the bird singing its song over and over again.